All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Ashley Benitez-Smith, and this is my talk. I'll complete my threat model later, Mom, InfoSec in Middle School. Um, so a little bit about me. I am a career and technology education teacher, or CTE, commonly known as Tech Ed, uh, in Frederick County Public Schools, that's in Maryland. Um, my certifications, I'm currently certified in secondary English, 7th through 12th grade, uh, middle school English and language arts, 4th through 9th grade, and then technology education, 7th through 12th grade. Uh, my education background, I have a, I'm currently pursuing my master's of science in curriculum and instruction in blended computer science, which I will talk about more later in this talk and what that means, um, at Hood College in Maryland. And then I got my bachelor's of arts um, in English lit from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, or UMBC as it's known. <clears throat> and um, I kind of have this up here not to just say, hey, yes, I'm qualified to teach children, I promise, but also to show you that a lot of teachers going into computer science um, are coming from other subject areas. I started out as a secondary English language arts teacher, and uh, I kind of joke about this, but I was given a tech ed class uh, mainly because I'm really good at turning a computer off and on. <laughs> um, but I have, uh, I started out my class with very tech enhanced and then they kind of hand, it schedule wise, it just worked out. And I absolutely fell in love with the type of classes and how they're taught and I've kind of never looked back since. Also, uh, um, I'm more like kind of the space sphere from Portal 2 where I'm just like, I like space. I like InfoSec. Um, I went to my first DEF CON at DEF CON 20 just because I have friends in the industry who said, come on to Vegas, it's great. And I'm like, yeah, sure, okay. And then I just kind of fell in love with the community and picking locks and breaking things. And sometimes it's terrifying, but also really cool what everyone does. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. I'm obviously not necessarily from computer science or from the industry, but I do love what you guys do. And I, you know, kind of want to impart that passion and knowledge to students. So getting into this talk today, I'm going to talk kind of first start off with a lot of computer science education initiatives that are happening and then work my way into security education. So um, there are a bunch of national initiatives happening. Um, there are 37 states and their governors kind of signed on to bring computer science education to their public school systems, which is great. Um, and I know code.org, they sometimes get a lot of flack for some of the things they do, but they've been very instrumental in kind of making that happen and they've given, um, they have kind of like nine policies or principles that kind of help states craft their own K through 12 curriculum. Um, and I have a couple links up here that, let's see if this works. Yay, it worked. Um, that this is like the most comprehensive um, kind of database or report that I could find at, you know, there's probably others that I maybe didn't look at. But it kind of shows the K through 12 computer science like policies and what states have done to implement standards. Um, and some states are further along than others. Um, it is a process. This is very new. Um, I know certain states are sometimes are just getting funding or just approving this initiative, while other states, like the one I'm from, Maryland, we have a timeline set. We're hitting some goals already, and um, just to give you an example: by 2036, I have to be certified in computer to continue to teach it, which I have some time, but I figured I'd get on that train early by taking like discrete math and hopefully JavaScript next. Um, and then the second link that I have up here, um, it kind of goes by state by state. Uh, and it's a spreadsheet of what states have done or what they're currently working on or what they haven't done yet. So like I said, you see a lot of yeses up here, but you also see a lot of noes. <laughs> um, and every state is different with their public education. Every state is different with how they legislate funding and stuff. Um, so this is kind of a good resource if you're looking to see, well, what has my state done or what has my you know, hometown done, done in regards to computer science? This may be a good place to start. All right, so let's get back to the slideshow. Oops. Not from first slide, current slide. All right, all right, and it did it again, yay. Let's go back, there we go. Um, so getting into some national security education initiatives. With the uh, focus in computer science, like security education is a must. 
Um, especially being from Maryland, there is a need with being so close to DC and the DMV area with all the contractors and all of the companies popping up. I know our state is, our standards are heavily focused with cybersecurity as it's a dub because parents and educators like the term cybersecurity better than, you know, hacking. So, um, the National in Initiative for Cybersecurity Education are nice. They have been going into conferences and working with, uh, educators and trying to, um, I guess, <clears throat> figure out standards and what the framework looks like for security education and kind of what it looks like, like K through 12. Um, cybersecurity workforce framework, that's another one. They are more on the professional side of things, but they're getting into more higher education and high school education and kind of seeing, you know, working with the, the pipeline, so to speak. Uh, the National Initiative for Cyber Careers and Studies, they're also more geared towards higher education, but they're starting to push into high school. Uh, the National Cryptologic Museum, they are creating a new center called the Cyber Center for Education and Innovation. And they are currently building a new building for the Cryptologic Museum. And in that building is going to house um, the, the CCEI, where they're creating cybersecurity education for primarily high school right now, but they, they will focus on middle school, or so they've said. And then Comic B, which is something I found out about at B-Sides Charm when I gave a very abbreviated version of this talk. Um, they are a company that is creating um, online curriculum where it's kind of a choose your own adventure like comic style story where middle school students can kind of choose, you know, based on their decision, like security stuff. And then it teaches them about like safety online and, and everything. And I haven't had a chance personally um, to like to kind of experiment with Comic Beat. It seems like a really good resource. All right. So there's also a lot of capture the flag competitions popping up for high school and middle school students. Uh, Pico CTF, which is one of the bigger ones, um, I know there are a bunch of high school teams in my district that are looking at Pico CTF for next year. And then Cyber Patriot is another one. We do have a couple Cyber Patriot teams in my district for high school. Uh, U.S. Cyber Challenge, that's another one. Gen Cyber, which is geared a little bit more towards like freshman and middle school students. Uh, Neverland CTF, which is something I discovered via Twitter. And my little CTF team kind of um, competed in and they absolutely loved it. Um, they also found out that there's a movie exists called Hackers. That was a fun talk with them. Um, also, no, don't tell your parents. And Miss Smith said to watch Hackers for homework. Please don't. I will not, I will not support that. <laughs> and then another local one that is in Central Maryland is Magic. They are a STEM nonprofit that is working towards like ha that puts on hackathons and has CTFs. And they have a lot of in-person CTFs, but you can also compete in them digitally, which is really cool. And um, I brought a team. Uh, one was happening at our local library in the county, and I brought a team there, and they had an absolute blast. They were really excited to get over a thousand points. So you got to start somewhere. Um, so as I'm going through computer science and like learning about all the security initiatives, um, there seems to be a problem that I kind of saw when I started this journey. Um, there's lots of development for high school courses. There's lots of development for post-secondary education, whether, you know, a student goes into trade school, you know, two year, four year university, or goes right, try to go right into the industry. Because some districts, especially in my county, we have a career and technology center where students can go and get different certifications before they even graduate high school. Um, so that's a track that they can choose. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of focus on classes and credentials. I understand, you know, trying to get those high school students early because high school students are starting to figure out what they want to do, where they want to go, their path after, you know, they graduate. But there's, there seem to be little to no resources for middle school, which is what I primarily teach. Um, I usually get the answer of, oh, it's in development or, uh, we're working on it. And you're like, oh, that's great, but what if I want to teach it now? Um, a lot of it does focus on basic digital literacy lessons, which are now being pushed more towards elementary school education, or very simple definitions of like, this is what a hacker is. And sometimes you see the, you know, stereotypical hoodie picture and the guy typing, and you're like, okay. So how do I, I kind of just thought like, how do I impart security education to my students? I want to teach this. Where do I start? What do I do? Just thinking about this, and then I get an idea. <laughs> um, why don't I just kind of cobble together and create my own security education unit 
and see what happens with that. If it doesn't work out, I never have to do this again. If it does, well, then I have something. So um, to kind of go back to um, more of my teaching style and my teaching philosophy, I teach um, seventh, I teach sixth, seventh, and eighth grade tech ed at my school, um, and I teach the elective courses. So uh, my sixth grade class is more of an exploratory course. My seventh grade class is actually the computer science course. And my eighth grade class is a pre-engineering course. Um, so I kind of am of the philosophy of what's called blended learning, and to kind of define that is combining educational technologies with um, like kind of more traditional teaching strategies to kind of personalize uh, classroom learning and have students kind of take back control of their learning. Not necessarily me always lecturing about this is what Python is, um, but them actually doing it, them actually you know getting in there and creating projects. Um, it's student, I, I will, I'm a former reliever of student choice, you know, within reason. And um, in my class, there's room for failure. So if a program doesn't work, or if they don't get the right answer right away, like, that's okay. As long as I don't, you know, keep failing every assignment, then we may have a problem there. But, you know, having that that idea of it's okay to fail and to learn from that failure goes a long way with kids' confidences um, in class. And then... Like I said, it's just combining new models with, you know, kind of the old traditional lessons and how we would teach. So that's kind of how, what I teach, you know, blended learning through all my classes, and especially for my seventh grade class, blended computer science. Because I feel like um, my, I guess, lack of education in computer science or in the field shouldn't hold back a student who can really excel. Um, and if I don't know the answer, I'll find someone who does. And not, not, I know not all teachers think that way. Like they think that they have to be the one that knows everything. And sometimes it's okay to admit you don't know something in class and say, I'll go find a resource or call up my husband, Mr. Smith, who's a software engineer and maybe he can figure it out. Or my dad who works in, with computers and security and stuff. <laughs> um, so my class in seventh grade is called Computer Science Investigations or CSI for short. Yes, that was done on purpose. Teachers, you know, we have a plan here. Um, and this is the, last year was the first full implementation of this. Um, the previous year I was, um, I was in the kind of like the guinea pig class where I tested the lessons out. Um, and then like last year was the first full year when we went through this countywide. So my first semester, I always do programming first just because that's where they get a lot of those computational thinking skills and a lot of problem solving skills. Um, and I let the students uh, pick their programming language. So the first year I had, I was it was kind of everywhere with JavaScript and Blockly and Scratch and Python and I kind of went nuts, but they learned a lot, which is good. And each, each um, language had a lesson sequence, and then there would be a final unit project for that particular language. And then the second half of the year, I kind of dubbed applications, where they kind of applied those, uh, what they learned in the first half of the year, to the second half. So like robotics, there was a research project, um, we did data and encryption, and then security education, or cybersecurity as it's dubbed in the curriculum. Um, towards the end of the year, just in case like something happened, I was like, well, it's the end of the year. Um, but I kind of ran out of time with that, so this year uh, I decided to kind of pare down the languages. I also had a, my, my classes grew in size, so I went from having, you know, like 28 kids last year to this year having 34 starting out the school year, which is always fun in a tiny computer lab. So I kind of had to pare down like the choice of languages, but we still had a great time with Python Scratch and, you know, Blockly, which is like the, I dubbed the code.org language. Um, and then I decided to start uh, the security education unit earlier, like after winter break, um, just because my classes, they were kind of getting fatigued with all the programming and they kind of needed something different. And then that carried over into the second half of the year, which I was like, yeah, I'm going to get through everything. And then the winter happened with snow, ice, delays, and closings, and I was like, great. <sighs> but um, I ended up with that moving cryptography into the data and encryption unit, which worked out really well. And currently my classes are at the end of the year project where they, they pick a final project based on something that we've learned in one of these units. Um, the most common one this year was uh, the Edison Lego BattleBots, which I kind of should have probably um, known that would be really popular. Kids are like, yes, BattleBots, let me break things, woo. Um, 
But yeah, so that's what my classes look like. Now the actual unit sequence, um, I'm gonna get into more details about the actual unit lessons, but I always start off with a white hat hacker code, um, and we talk about the difference between white hat, black hat, gray hat, um, and I make sure to send this permission, permission slip home, you know, like at least a week or two before I start the unit, just to make sure it's all in, Parents are okay with this, you know, and, you know, I don't get fired for any reason. <laughs> and also we go over the rules and expectations and what to do and what not to do, kind of the Spider-Man ethos of with great power comes great responsibility. I'm pretty sure that's in my slideshow when I talk about this. Um, and the kids really, you know, they, regardless of how they actually behave, they really kind of adhere to that, which is good. Um, and then I have, I start off with a pre-assessment called the Security Breakout EDU that I created. And Breakout EDU is kind of like a CTF slash escape room, but really pared down for students. Um, and there's all kinds of Breakout EDUs for all kinds of subject areas. So I created one based on the stuff that we do in the unit. And that seemed to work out really well to one, kind of gauge frustration levels, two, see what they already know. Cause some, some students have parents in the industry and they already know like lots more stuff than I do. Um, to see if they actually know what social engineering is or they, you know, know maybe or how to brute force something. And we do a reflection with that. There's a reflection sheet that says, all right, how many did you get on your own? How many did you get with some help from Ms. Smith, myself, or another classmate? Or how many did you not understand? It just were like, I'm, I'm just going to skip over this. And the students are really honest about that and ask some really good questions. Obviously, I get, if you uh, attend uh, Jay Smith's talk earlier today, I get the uh, occasional, is this what it's like in the movies? And you're like, yeah, no, maybe so, yeah, depending. Um, all right, so let's get into it. So we start off with passwords and personal, uh, personal identifiable information, or PII. And for this lesson module, I do what's known as a station rotation. Um, and I've done this two ways. Last year, I did it as... I put my students in groups, I grouped them up, and they had a time limit, and they did each station in with different activities. Um, and I did not create this from scratch. I adapted a lot of this lesson module from the EFF Security Education Companion, which I love the EFF for, for having somewhere, you know, resource-wise to start. Um, so I took a bunch of those lessons and kind of made it a station rotation for my students. Um, and I have four, those four stations are brute forcing and PII, which is something that I talk about and like do a mini lecture, so to speak. And we look at one of the images from the pre-assessment and we identify what potential passwords could be, could have been exposed on the social media webpage, what potential PII could have been there. Actually, once they get going, they really start to realize like, wow, this person, well, fictitious person, put a lot of stuff on here that compromise their accounts. Um, then we lo look at password managers and password strength, like what's a good password versus a bad password, why a whole jumble of crazy letters may not be the best thing for them all the time. Also to remember. Uh, we look at 2 company analysis, which is one of the lessons from the EFF uh, security companion. And they, they, they really like are interested in that. They're like, wait a minute, like, uh, Twitch doesn't have this, or like, you know, Netflix doesn't have that. So it kind of makes them think about the, the, uh, online services and the websites and the apps that they use and they go to with, wait, how secure act is this actually? Um, and then we do multi-step authentication, you know, what's the best for what situation? And then the assessment for this lesson module, um, oops, go back. Sorry. I did not mean to do that. Where was I? There we go. Start slideshow from current slide. Sorry about that. And it's going to do that thing. There we go. So um, they analyze, they have a client, they're in, I put them in groups and they're in their own little security um, company. And they have a client, WT Poo, who was hacked, oh no, and all social media accounts have been compromised. Um, and I had a bit of fun with this, with some of the things. And they have to analyze the images or the social media pages that um, for potential PII or passwords that could have been exposed. Like on this one here where Mr. Pooh says he usually use short ones like Honey5. Um, and then they create a presentation to present to the quote client, which usually, you know, I am looking at and they can either choose to present, you know, in front of the class or just to me. And like what happened, where were the security flaws and what the client could do to uh, safeguard themselves against this next time. 
Where's my mouse? There it is. And then we get into malware, and um, they do a little bit of malware research where they pick one type and they research it, and then they create a visual representation of that. And I've done this two ways due to you know, time and weather. Uh, the first time I did this, I created something called Malware Puppet Pals, where my students, yeah, my students had to create lunch bag puppets, um, and that was an experience. And they had to create a public service announcement to share with elementary school students to um, kind of warn them about the danger of a malware and how to protect themselves. Um, and I sent a few off to the local elementary schools and got some very interesting feedback. But like that year, I had a few theater kids and artistic kids in my who you know really love theater and art in my class, and that was a really great way to kind of showcase their skills. They were like, "Yes, this is my thing. This is my jam." Um, and then this year, because of time and weather, I had to kind of pare it down to an infographic, which still was the students really like to make. They they're like, "Yes, pictures, colors, woohoo!" Um, and we kind of printed the, we printed out like the really good ones and post them around the school and like put them in the library. Um, so that works out. So I have two of those lessons up there, which for whichever one fits the classroom the best. Social engineering, one of my personal favorites, because I feel like 75% 75, 75 of my job is social engineering. <laughs> um, so how I start this lesson module off is I actually started earlier. Um, I hand, Oh, well first let me get to the fact that I adapted this from the Security Education Companion again and um, from the Social Engineering Village that uh, presents at Dexcom. I know that was one of the villages I went to, which I was super excited about and really, really, it was really cool to see the talks like live, or not the talks, the calls, I should say. Um, so I started there because that's just a resource I knew about and then once I actually looked more at the Security Education Companion, I was like, oh, there are lessons here, thank God. Um, so my pre I actually create, I actually do simulated phishing attack on my class. <laughs> and so far, no student has ever figured out that it actually happens until I tell them afterwards. Um, which is good and bad, depending on, you know, how you take that. But, um, so I usually hand out a paper survey. Um, about, in my school we have like extra recess and time kind of built in so that they can like choose an activity they want to do based on like, you know, how they've done during the term and stuff. And so I handed out a survey asking, you know, just sometimes, you know, the security questions that you would see maybe on a website, like, what's your favorite color? Where did you go to elementary school? Um, and then I get, got into, like, their favorite activities, and then <clears throat> the question that always gets them, regardless of the fact that they're currently learning about cybersecurity, is, do you want to play Fortnite at recess? And then all the red flags go out the window. The kids are like, what, Fortnite? Yes! Um, especially with my class this year, which I'm pretty sure most of them play that game. And it just so happened this year that I also got new computers with updated graphics cards in my computer lab. And I was like, yeah, these puppies? Oh, yeah, they will definitely run Fortnite. And so, of course, they were, like, giving me everything they could to make that happen. And then a day after, or two days after, depending, then we actually start the unit where I go, sorry, guys, there's no Fortnite at recess. And after they go through, you know, they feel betrayed, they feel like this, that, why would you do that to us, Ms. Smith, how we trust you. And then I go, well, someone who could be posing as me, who you trust, could try to get your information and do a phishing attack on you. And then you could hear a pin drop in the classroom and they go, oh, okay. Gotcha. And then they, then you know you, you kind of have them. So then the lessons, there are the many lessons, there are three. So I, with the, with the uh, simulated phishing attack, I do the six principles of social engineering. Um, and usually I have these in what's called a playlist format where students have videos and then I kind of built in conferences where we, I talk one on one with the students and they learn about the, the six principles and then they come to me and we discuss what they learned and then I hand them back their, their, um, sorry, just make sure I'm good on time, their survey, and I grade their survey based on how compromised they would have been if it was a real attack, you know, with different colored stars. Some have three, some have one or two, but every time I've done this, every student has been compromised in some way. Um, and we have, a, there are really good discussions that come of that, and then they kind of self-reflect and analyze their own survey, and a lot of them realized that I, as soon as I saw that Fortnite question, I didn't think about anything else, and I really have to be careful in what I read. Um, and then we go over to attacks and techniques where they make brochures to educate other students, and then we do threat modeling and risk assessment, 
which I pull from the education, uh, security education companion. We do the sunglass one first. And then they get to their assessment, which is a simulation prompt. They're again in different little cybersecurity company groups. And they have to do a threat model and risk assessment for a gaming company called Myst. And um, they've been getting, it's kind of like they've been getting some, you know, phishing emails, they've been getting some weird calls, and they just don't know what's going on, so they hire the group to kind of figure out what's happening. And um, they make another presentation to the client, and they can choose the type. It could be a video, it could be them, you know, doing maybe a live skit of what, how that would go. Um, and they can present to the class or me, because um, teaching, in all my years of experience, like, there are students who have legitimate anxiety about coming up and speaking in front of people. And to always have that choice, whether it's to me or they just make the video and I view it later, that goes a long way with some kids. Um, you know, this isn't for the student that is like, I don't want to do that, no worries. But it, it's kind of just a way for a student who does have a, a anxiety about it to kind of present and display their learning without having to just stand up in front of the class. Doing pretty good on time. All right, cryptography, another one of my personal favorites. Um, and really a lot of students really love and enjoy because it's a puzzle they want to figure out and like what's the code and how does it work and what's the key. Um, so we do a lot of, I just do a lot of basic introductory research with this, um, some basic history because the high school classes that are in the curriculum in my district, they're hitting cryptography really like a lot. And I don't want to overlap with what information they're, you know, going to teach students. I try to really be conscious of that. Like, okay, what are the high school uh, students doing versus like what my middle school students will do? So um, we do a lot of basic stuff with that. And there are lesson modules. I use the code.org lesson modules because they actually break down like data encryption and cryptography really well for students. And a lot of students, this is their first time. Um, getting into it. So it's a really good like starting point. Um, and they kind of self-select the puzzles from those modules that they want to, uh, they want to, uh, try to solve. And then I have teacher created challenges where I'm like, all right, here you go, it's Miss Smith's turn. And I, you know, use a bunch of different ciphers. I always make sure to do different ones each year. So like they can't come back in eighth grade to give their little brother or sister like, hey, here's the answers. Keeps it, keeps it fresh. Um, and it's kind of like they can, they can solve them at their own pace. And then I kind of challenge them to create their own challenges so that they can challenge other students or they can challenge me. So kind of like a two way road there. And then current events. Now, the last part of this unit, um, I tried to, I debated whether to do career research or current events and other classes do career research where security is touched upon, or it's one of the choices they could do. So I decided to go with current events, just because I know students, sometimes they don't necessarily, reading the news, not maybe their first thing that they do when they wake up in the morning, like some adults. Um, so we discuss current events in class. I'll discuss some for warm up. I know last year it was like Equifax, I kind of hit really hard. This year it was Marriott, and I had a student go, oh yeah, I heard about that. I'm kind of worried about my mom. She just stayed there recently for a business trip. <laughs> Um, and then I give a list of events, like w different breaches and data leaks and so on and so forth, and they choose one, they research a bit about it, and they create a presentation to educate other middle school students, because my classes are elective, so not every student either takes it or gets to take it, depending on how many sections we run in the year. And then again, it's another choice of presentation, and usually this one is pretty short because um, last year I didn't even get to it. This year it was kind of cut short due to time and weather and just the new start of the term. So, uh, where does this leave us? You know, because I, I work in education, um, you all work in cybersecurity or some form of it, I, I assume, or security. And, um, you know, collaboration is going to be a big factor here for everybody involved. Um, sharing resources. So my last slide has a bit.ly link to a folder where I put, have put everything there. Um, it's not as organized as I want it to be just because of the school year. Um, but I plan on organizing it over the summer and putting more lesson overviews into it. So it's a little easier to manage and read for other people. Um, and sharing resources is really important. I build, I'm a big believer in the price of free, which a lot of teachers do appreciate. So I'm not asking for money for any of this. If And the link is also on my business card if you want to grab one. Um, other teachers and, you know, industry professional feedback is so important, especially with a button curriculum like this. Um, cause if we can get it right from the get-go, 
it'll be awesome. But sometimes you don't get things right from the get-go, and it's sometimes it's very hard to change them. Um, and I have shared these resources with first just other teachers in my district because they were like, okay, well, what else can we teach kids, not just programming? Um, and then I kind of shared these out, and some teachers have been doing just like one or two lessons. Other teachers went through the whole unit, and they gave me some great constructive feedback and positive feedback. Um, and they, in turn, then created their own lessons for their classroom, which is great. So it's kind of like if you have it, teachers can use it. Kind of if you build it, they will come mentality. Um, we also, I also want to inspire the next generation. You know, as teachers, that's what we want to do. We want to inspire kids to be the best they can be and to make an impact on the world. And with security education, um, no offense to anyone in this room, including myself, no one's getting any younger. <laughs> so we're going to need a workforce that can problem solve, that can have these computational thinking skills, that can think outside the box and have maybe some of the security knowledge already in from their K through 12 education. Um, and I'm also a big believer in security knowledge for everyone. Um, and that anyone and everyone can learn this. Um, and user education is going to be a very big thing. It makes everyone's job easier when the user can kind of identify a basic phishing attack. Um, and my classes, I don't know about every school or district, everyone's different, but my classes are homogeneously mixed. So I have students who are you know, above their reading level, and I have students who are way below reading level. And no matter what, all students can learn about security education. So I figure it's going to be one of those almost like two in, like really important skills that they have to learn regardless of what they go into. It's just going to be become that 21st century skill that they need, just like problem solving or computational thinking. Uh, professional development, because like I said, <laughs> teachers were coming from different areas. There, I've yet to encounter a comp sci major who goes, yeah, I want to go into teaching first. Woohoo! Yeah, that doesn't happen, sadly. Um, or it, maybe it doesn't, I just haven't met those people yet. But if there's a for educators section in like a conference website, or maybe, you know, in a think tank website or nonprofit, as, if there's a section for educators that we can just go to for links of resources or actual resources, that really helps us because um, kind of, backing off of what Jay Smith said. Teachers, we have a lot on our plates. Sometimes I'm pretty sure my plate is broken on the floor somewhere. I just haven't found the pieces yet to put it all back together. Um, and it's really tough. Some, I mean, some teachers are sometimes stand-in parents for students because their home lives are that chaotic or broken. Um, but if there's a uh, for educator section, that just helps everyone out greatly on education side. Um, Maybe teacher stipends for conferences or, you know, tickets. Like, I know there's a lot of student tickets or scholarships that some conferences do. And I know not every conference, you know, is a big conference that can do that. But if there's, like, someone willing to, like, donate a ticket for a teacher as well, or, you know, regardless of what they teach, that goes a long way, too. Um, if there any sort of help we can get, that's great. Um, also, I also forgot about this on my last slide, but it's also, I don't know if I need to tell you guys, but teaching, not exactly the six-figure career option that everyone wants to go into. So some teachers need to work those second or third jobs to make ends meet, and that kind of scholarship stuff really goes a long way. I'm very fortunate and privileged enough that I don't have to work during the summer, but a lot of teachers do. So just kind of keep that in mind as, you, as we kind of go forward with this. And then mentoring and volunteering, um, which I know, depending on the school and depending on the district, it can be different. You may have to go through volunteer training. I know in our district, all parents and volunteers do, regardless of what they do in the school. Um, but kind of a place to start, you can contact the local career and technology curriculum specialists or coordinators. And if they don't get back to you, because I know sometimes they don't even get back to me on some things in a timely fashion, just because of things that they do. Um, local teachers. And if you attended Jay Smith's talk, I can't reference it enough. Um, or if you didn't get a chance to watch, maybe watch it, talk to him and his experiences, because it's also how you kind of market yourself sometimes with some school districts. I know I'm the teacher, I'm like, sweet, okay, I'll schedule you for like this week. Whereas other teachers have a lot more on their plate or maybe don't necessarily have the time or figure it out. And try to, kind of quoting what he said, always go for the teachers first because administrators, they'll just forward it to us. They're like, hey, this person contacted me and I think it'd be great for your class. And sometimes they may or may not know what exactly it is. 
just depending. Um, if you can volunteer to speak at a career day, I know our district has a few career days for high school and middle school students, um, do that. Like Kids will ask questions, they will be interested. There's genuine interest here regardless. Um, also, extracurricular activities. You could be a mentor for a CTF team. If you can coach a CTF team, if you could do a club after school, or maybe even at the local library. Um, a lot of libraries are doing you know, STEM clubs and stuff like that. That goes a long way too. That, that just really helps. Because I feel like going forward with all of this education initiatives and all these lessons being created that are currently there or yet to be created, we really have to work together to make sure it's the best it can be. So uh, there's my information, and I know I have two schools on there. Um, I currently work at Brunswick Middle School, but I'm moving to the high school next year just because um, a position opened up where it's mostly computer science that I'm teaching, and um, there's also an advanced computing course, which is like, I dub it like the more red team hacking course, uh, which I was like, yes, I want to teach that, and I'm kind of following my first set of computer science students, much to some of their excitement, excitement and some of, some of them are slightly dismayed but <laughs> um, so I will be leaving the middle school realm, but I feel like I have like laid a lot of good groundwork for other teachers to just go and run with things. Um, and there's my email, that's not gonna change. And there's my Twitter handle if you wanna hit me up on the Twitter sphere, I suppose. And then there's the resource link. Like I said, it's also on my business cards. Um, but if you wanna take a picture of the slide and send it to whoever, please do. Um, and looks like I have about eight and a half minutes or so for questions. Yes? Um, so I, I've spoken at uh, a couple of schools okay. about um, like education about, um, so I've, I've talked to some school programs about um, potential STEM careers and kind of what it's like to work in the industry. Uh, is there any way to kind of just post your information as being open to talking? Um, do you know of any kind of lists where you could present that? Because it can be quite a lot of work to contact schools individually when they might not have anyone. Right. Um, there's nothing that I personally know of, but um, if you just have like a kind of like a default email, once you draft it, you can just kind of copy and paste it and change around a few things and then just send it off to whomever. Um, also, if you have a website where you can just post that information, that might be a little easier than personally individually going and contacting schools and stuff like that. Um, like I said, teachers are sometimes behind with technology. A lot of them are getting their first Twitter accounts for the first time. Um, you know, so we'll, we'll eventually catch up kind of thing. But yeah, um, I don't know of any like list nationally that would be, would be the thing. I mean, if somebody does, that's great. And please tell me too. Yes. Uh, yeah, Safe and Secure Online has one. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Safe and Secure Online has one, but most teachers have never heard of it. Yeah, so same. <laughs> I listed myself and I did the background check and all that and then it never, nothing ever came through, so. Thank you for that. So there's something, but maybe it can be better, right? Any other questions? Yes. Just real quick, who's, what advocates have you run into that have kind of helped you get this so far? Just to share. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just curious in your experience. Yeah. So um, I have a lot. My, my administration has been very open to going, hey, I'm going to do this. Is that cool? And they're like, yeah, sure. What exactly is that? So I have a, I, I'm blessed with the fact that my administrators, my assistant principal and my principal are very open to a lot of these like initiatives. Um, like when I started my CTF team this year, I just went, hey, so I'm starting an ethical hacking club. Like, that's cool. We're going to participate in CTFs. And they're like, yeah, that sounds great. What is it? What? Hold on. You said hacking. Um, and they, they seem to be really open with that. Um, so my administration has been a big supporter of me. Um, my, also my cur curriculum coordinator um, and my curriculum specialist, they have also been very supportive of like what I'm doing because um, I kind of piped up saying, hey, we should teach computer science like this and not necessarily just focus heavily on programming. And so they kind of roped me in when I first got into CTE to kind of help develop the computer science stuff in for my district. Um, so they've been really big um, advocates for me as well if I've ever needed anything. Um, and just other teachers, I guess, just being receptive and giving constructive, constructive feedback throughout the county. Because my county, we kind of have professional days before, during, and after the school year where we kind of get together, discuss things. And you know, they, like other teachers, have been really receptive and really supportive of that. So I, I've been very very blessed with that kind of support system where I know some schools and educators and administrators 
are not like that and they're not as supportive. Like I said, every school district is different um, and even public versus private is very different and even public versus charter versus private is super different. Um, so if you can also be an advocate for maybe a teacher that doesn't necessarily have that support system and try to find those people who will listen, that also helps. I hope that answered the question. Okay, good. Any other thing, comments, concerns, questions? Musings? <laughs> Does your breakout on your resources? Yes. So all the puzzles are in a Google are in Google Forms. And my so my resources are there. Like I said, it's not as organized as I would have liked it to be, just because of the chaos of the end of the school year. Um, so I'll be kind of organizing those more over the summer. Um, but yeah, all my security breakout stuff is is in this link in this folder. And if you if something doesn't work, please email me. I do check my email over the summer like a crazy teacher. <laughs> Anything else? All right, well, that's my talk. Um, if you want to talk to me further or get my business card, I'm more than welcome. Thank you. This is great. This is fun. <gasps>